All right. Hello, students. Welcome to lesson 32 on the Family School Online, year three on the high school, Deciduous Trees. And we are going to talk about uh, the angiosperm trees today. And uh, Anna is going to take us through the first academic concept. Okay, so Anna. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alrighty. So the first academic concept says the majority of plant species on the earth are angiosperms. Most deciduous trees are angiosperms. And so in the last lesson we learned about gymnosperms, which are plants that create seeds but don't have flowers. So those would include like pine trees and things like that. And today we're going to learn about the other side of the classification called angiosperms, which are plants that... Mm -hmm. Anna? Um, Anna? Can you hear me? We can hear you, but there's also a lot of background sound, okay, like uh, oh, okay. muscle Sorry. sounds. Okay, if you have a microphone, that works uh, better, okay, instead of just talking to the computer. If not, you have to be careful not to make other noises. Does that make sense? Can you hear me now better? Much better. Uh -huh. okay, sorry, I was trying a different way to use my microphone. So okay. Uh -huh. Hopefully this works better. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. So. So sorry, you were telling about the last time we were talking about the gymnosperms. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So last time we were talking about gymnosperms, but sorry plants that create seeds but don't have flowers. And today we're going to learn about angiosperms, which are plants that produce both seeds and flowers. Mm -hmm. And so when I was reading through this lesson, I thought it was interesting to read how many different types of species are in each different kind of grouping or classification of plants, like non-vascular plants and non-seed plants, and how angiosperms have the most number of species. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense because it's the largest group of plants on the earth. Most of the plants on the earth are angiosperm. Yeah. And so, specifically today, I guess it's focusing on a type of angiosperm called the deciduous. And the word deciduous means to fall off. And so, a deciduous tree or plant would be a plant that drops their leaves when it gets cold in the fall. Mm -hmm. And so, let's see. The chart that it showed in the lesson was really cool to see you know, the angiosperms, how big that group is versus all the other ones combined. Yeah, this pie chart on the screen. I thought that was really cool and it really put it in perspective. Yeah, when you see, you know, when you see the numbers is, uh, okay, yeah, you can imagine that there's a lot, but when you see the pie chart, really, it makes a huge <laughs> difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially what is very interesting is the number of gymnosperms. See the proportion of a species of gymnosperms. Okay. Not very much. Not very much. Not very much. Now, I wonder, I would love to see if there's a pie chart showing the mass, okay, of the biome of each type. Do you know what I mean by that? Um, like what areas have a certain yeah. amount of plants? Yeah, the area or more than the area, more like the, the, the weight, okay? So, you know, what would be the, the amount of uh, living biomass of each one of these types, okay? Because my understanding is that even though the gymnosperms, there are very few species relatively, as far as biomass, they are quite large because they, they are lots of conifer trees and conifer forest, and, and also they are very large and massive trees. You know, imagine, you know, the, the redwood trees we talk about and so on. So. I'm going to see if if uh, we can find that. That would be interesting to see the yeah. the distribution of that. 
this just tells the different number of species, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, later on in the lesson, it talks about how um, in the fall, when it gets colder, um, the leaves stop doing the photosynthesis process, and they change color, and eventually they turn brown, and they fall off the trees, which is part of what a deciduous tree does. Mm -hmm. And so, there's lots of deciduous trees, and all fruit trees are deciduous, and... Let's see, this video is cool because it showed a bunch of different types of deciduous and non-deciduous trees. Um, but in the video I learned that evergreen trees, they also drop their leaves, but they're continually growing the pine needles and things like that. So mm -hmm. they're not deciduous, even though they do shed their pine needles. And then, yeah, that is, that is interesting that there are some of these evergreen trees that are still shed, okay, but they continually grow new new pine needles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then I also learned that it was interesting that um, there's some conifer trees, which are a type of dimness ferns, um, that are evergreen. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's some that actually do lose their leaves in the um, fall and winter, just like a deciduous tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not not everything is exactly, you know, not all conifers are evergreen and not all uh, angiosperms are deciduous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Let's see, another thing from the video was that it mentioned that um, deciduous trees, they don't just lose their leaves due to coldness, but also dryness. So, like, if you're in, like, Florida or something, it doesn't get very cold there, but... Um, trees can lose their leaves when it gets really dry there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was also really interesting to note that um, even in the different types of trees, like an oak tree was an example in the video, there can be a deciduous oak tree, type of oak tree, and there can also be a type of evergreen oak tree. So that was really funny, uh -huh. interesting. All vary depending on where you are and what kind of, what kind of tree there is. Yes. And I think that's pretty much what I learned from this academic concept. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. That's great. So Emma says here in North Carolina we have a lot of pines, like no joke, at least where I'm at. I can tell you personally, you have pine needles and pine cones on the ground all the time, okay? And you see that even here in the, in, in the video, all the different pine needles, okay, underneath these, uh, these pine trees, all right? One of the things that I I've understand and heard is that, do you know why... Um, you know, like in this case, you see that there's no other plants growing in under the canopy of these pine trees. Okay, so um, Patrick says pine needles are a great fire starter. Yes, uh huh. But so this is in in Florida. You know, this this video that, that the, the guy was showing us. But why is it that other plants don't grow on the underbrush of um, conifer trees? Okay, so you see here in, the, in this part of the forest, okay, where I have the mouse, there's probably some deciduous trees and there's a underground growth, mm -hmm. underground growth. So Samuel says, not enough sun? Mm -hmm. That is, that is a good thing, but you, you see that there is sun, so the canopy does let sun go through. Camden says the pine needles are acidic. Yes, uh -huh. that is what I understand, is that the pine needles are acidic, okay, and so they don't let other uh, species grow, okay, 
very, very interesting. And so that is why normally you would see that underneath the canopy of conifer trees, where they shed the, the, the needles down, there's no other um, trees growing under there. Very, very interesting. Okay. So you see that the canopy is quite open there. So it would have been able to, to let the, the sun go. Okay. But the pine needles don't allow other species to, to grow. So they, they don't like competition. <laughs> okay. Very, very good. Okay, let's see. Thank you, Anna. Jens, would you like to take it the next part? All right. Let me see. Do I need to unmute you? Yes. Okay, let me unmute Jens. Da, 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 da. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Go ahead. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh-huh. All right. Sweet. So um, my academic concept is about how trees provide, like, all different kinds of things for us to use. And, like, the, the list is endless. Like, there's so <laughs> yes. many things trees do for us, like, living or, like, harvested. Um, and um, just like to name a few, like oxygen and shade when they're like living and like to look at them, it's really pretty. And then like if they're har harvested, we use paper and pencils all the time in school. And so that helps us learn and educate ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, trees are very important to our lives and um, change a lot of things that um, we may not have um, and so we are able to like use trees to our benefit a lot and um, be able to um, pretty much change our way of life just by trees. Um, so um, they live in um, the forest and around Colorado there's a lot here Mm -hmm, um, especially mm -hmm. with the conifers and um, so the temperate dis, uh, the temperate I don't know how to pronounce it deciduous yes exactly uh, the temperate deciduous forest is like it's not like um, a lot of like other forests it's like very cool and it's like it doesn't reach very high temperatures because there's so much shade um, mm -hmm. from the trees um, and it's mostly in cool, cooler parts of the world, um, and um, there's like it's found like um, from like for Florida onto like Middle America. Um, there's like tons of animals that live in the forest and provide shelter for bears and foxes and um, raccoons and um, many rivers that have salmon and um, a lot of different um, fish mm -hmm. and provide a lot of life. Yeah, so the deciduous forest is really one of the, the ideal places for, the, um, for animals to, to thrive. And I like this video how it shows kind of the different food chains on, on, on Things. What did you learn about that, Jens? Um, it's pretty cool. I like the food chain works, and it like all works together to like um, support each other. Even though like animals are dying, they're like supporting each other, and they're like um, able to like um, live. And um, the deer are beautiful, and um, it's just really cool to like see how the animal chain is like or the feet food chain is so like planned and like everything just works and like fits into place so perfectly absolutely yes aha uh -huh. so that is also an interesting thing that when we talk about a forest we are not only talking really about just the the plants okay 
but the animals are also a big part of the forest and the fungi and the bacteria because you know remember that those are the fungi and the bacteria are the decomposers so everything that is left over okay uh, even you know the bones of the the, the, the salmon that was eaten on, or, or the dead trees and so on they need to be decomposed by fungi in order to rejuvenate and regenerate the forest. It's a, it's a really a complex um, living system of different things. Mm -hmm. See, for example, here you have this little fox is coming out of a hollow log. So who made the house? Who made the house for the foxes? Um, like the bacteria and the fungi and yeah. maybe some termites even? Absolutely, yes. Some termites, you know, the termites start eating the wood. They, they, they process that and then the bacteria and fungi get everything out and now the foxes have a home. Okay. So even those things are, are all part of the... The, the ecosystem of the forest. It's amazing, really. Very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Um, I think that's it. It's just really cool to have such beauty and such wonder around us and how everything just kind of works together. Yes, uh -huh. it is really, really amazing. I, I didn't include this part in the, in the lesson, okay, but I thought these pictures really beautiful, okay, so we have here a picture of a deciduous forest in autumn, and someone was saying here that the colors are, are beautiful in the fall, okay, so, you know, when the trees change colors, it's a, a, a beautiful spectacle, really. Samuel says, here in Southern California, we have oak and pine trees growing side by side. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's beautiful in the, in the fall, how the forest changes. Here we have the look at the forest in winter and how all the deciduous trees have given, you know, fallen their leaves. Okay. One of the characteristics also of deciduous trees is that they have broad leaves and so the, the leaves would not be able to support the snow. If a snow accumulates, they would actually break the branches and so it's good that the, the deciduous trees shed their leaves so they won't accumulate snow. Mm -hmm. Now here we have the look in the spring. Okay, and of course in the summer when the flowers bloom and everything, beautiful spectacle of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, all right, uh, Aubrey says in Colorado up in the mountains there is a section that has lots and lots of aspen and it's just gorgeous in the fall. Okay. Yes, it's beautiful, really. Now, Aubrey, since you mentioned that about the, the, the aspen grove, okay, and let me unmute Aubrey. Hi, Aubrey. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, did you, do you know how one of the ways, of course, that aspen trees, they produce seed, okay, but how do aspen trees uh, propagate? Do you know how they they reproduce the aspen like, trees? Aren't they like one big uh, organism? Like yeah. they like are all connected to each other? Yes, they absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so how do they propagate? How is it that they are connected? Mm, by their roots? By and their roots, absolutely, yes. So the aspen trees, they have a tap root that goes down, 
okay, and that one is the one that gets mostly the nutrients, okay, and the water, and then they have very shallow uh, lateral roots, okay, and those roots, they go, you know, just a couple of inches below ground, and they shoot new uh, trees growing up, okay, growing upwards, the new stems and, and trunks of new trees that way. And so, usually when you see a, an aspirin grow, how many trees are you actually seeing? <laughs> One big tree. <laughs> One big tree, yes, uh-huh. That's in absolutely Utah, right. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. In Utah, isn't there one big, like it's the biggest living organism in the world for like trees with yeah. aspens? Mm -hmm. That is what I've heard that the, the um, let me see, uh, uh, let's see if they have something, okay, no, in, so, okay, panda tree, all right, so, Pando is uh, also known as the trembling giant, okay? It's a col clonal colony of a single male quaking aspen, determined to be a single living organism by identical genetic markers, okay? And assumed to have one massive underground root system. The plant is estimated to weigh collectively 6,600 tons, making it the heaviest known organism, okay? And it is estimated to be 80,000 years old. <laughs> oh, my goodness. If one of, if that tree died, that was the main heart of it all, would all of them die? So, um, this is one of the problems with, with aspen trees, okay, because they all have the same genetic material and because they are all connected, basically all, the whole tree is one, one whole thing, um, many times if a, if a virus attacks the forest, it could actually kill the whole forest. Okay, so it is, it is kind of a, an interesting thing, all right, but a pando apparently uh, has been able to make do, okay, because imagine if it's 80,000 years old, I think that it has found ways to fight off a, a lot of different bacteria infections, mm -hmm. okay. What do you think? Okay, any comments? Um, let's see. Patrick says, I thought that the biggest organism in the world was a mycelium patch. All right. So, my understanding is that this one, Pando, is the heaviest. Okay, so the heaviest, and, and so imagine, this is again what we, similar to what we were talking about here, this pie chart shows numbers of species, but it doesn't show the number, you know, the, the, the biomass, all right? So the mycelium patch that we were talking about when we did the lesson on fungi, eh, it's the largest in area. Okay, so that is the largest organism in area, but if you think about it, the fungi doesn't weigh much, all right? They are, you know, basically these very, very thin uh, webs of mycelium. The cells are very small and everything, but they grow underneath the forest for a long, long ways, okay? So, Aubrey, you have a comment? Go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I was just thinking about like if this like whole entire like organism died how sad that would be because in Colorado we had like a bug thing go through in the mountains and there's a lot a lot of trees dead 
there, and so it's not as beautiful as it used to be. And so I think that we just kind of have to have more respect for those kind of things and, you know, like it before it's gone <laughs> because a lot of trees are really dead uh -huh. in Colorado. Yes, yes, uh-huh. So, you know, that is, that is a very good point and very interesting. Now, the, the thing is that somehow, okay, it seems that even in those forests where you have some, some sort of virus or, 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 or insect, okay, that kills a lot of the forest, the forest usually tend to be able to regenerate. Okay, and that is one of the things. So sometimes it's, it's good for the forest to kind of die, and then out of the, the dead forest, then you have the bacteria and the fungi decomposing all that material, and a new forest would uh, regenerate. Okay, because imagine Pando, precisely uh, like in this example, it's not that you can say that the, the organism is determined by the tree rings, okay? You cannot say that one single tree or a tree trunk is 80,000 years old. The whole thing is that old, but the, the, the current uh, tree trunks that we see are probably quite young, relatively young, okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. A Aubrey says a good portion of the forest hasn't recovered yet. That's tr that's right. Yeah, and 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 that is also a difference um, about the time scale. Okay, so you know our our time as uh, humans is uh, we are, if you wish, pretty impatient with these things. Okay, because we, we want, you know, we see a forest that is dead, that has been affected by, by a bug and so on, and, and we don't see it regenerating in, in a couple of years, and we think that that is a long time. But for trees, and in geological times, that is, that is not a whole lot of time, okay? So sometimes you, 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 need, to give, uh, you need to give it a little bit more, more time to, to those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Many times it's important to let also um, a wildfires uh, destroy a, an old forest, okay, and that also provides nutrients and things for a new forest to, to grow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. So let me go back here to the deciduous tree article, okay, and I, I read this portion of the article last night, okay, thank you Aubrey for your, your participation and comments, okay, and so now I'm going to ask a couple of questions here to everyone, so <clears throat> Let me see. So it says regions of forest. Forests where a majority of the trees lose their foliage at the end of the typical growing season are called deciduous forests. All right. But there are two types of deciduous forests around the world. So we have the temperate deciduous forest, which is the one that uh, Jens was uh, talking about. Okay, you know, the, the ones in uh, North and South America, Asia, and Europe, and the Himalayas, all right, so this would be the one that we saw here, let's see if we can get the map back there, okay, so this would be the temperate deciduous forest, these areas, Australia, New Zealand, the tip of South America, okay, this in the Patagonia in Argentina and Chile, beautiful, beautiful area. A lot of the East and Midwest in the United States and a lot of Europe and part of Asia, the western part of, of Russia. Okay, so that is the temperate deciduous forest. But then there's another 
deciduous forest that is the tropical and subtropical uh, deciduous forest. So Patrick says uh, it's in Wisconsin. Yes, that's right. In Wisconsin, we have also the deciduous forest. And we start also to have a lot of um, the, the gymnosperms, the conifers, okay, in there. So in the tropical and subtropical deciduous forest, you don't have a, that the trees don't lose their leaves because of a change of seasons, because in the tropics, there's really not much distinction between the seasons. But what happens is that the trees, the foliage, is, the foliage is dropped to conserve water and prevent death from drought. So they are usually kind of a, a dry season. And so when you have a dry season, the trees drop their leaves in order not to use so much water. Okay. So that is a different type also of the serious forest. Okay. So I thought that that was interesting, the two types of, of the serious forest. Mm -hmm. And the, the tropical and subtropical deciduous forest is, is a, in a different area, okay? So it's more in, in again, Central America and, and Brazil, the Amazon is a, a deciduous forest, okay? So we have the Sri Lanka, Southeast Indonesia, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of places like that. Excellent. Okay, so now let's see, go back here to the lesson. Now let's say have um, Ryan help us out here with the gospel principle. Okay, um, so do you want me to go ahead and uh, get the screen up? Yes, uh -huh. let me make you the presenter. Mm -hmm. Change presenter and we go Ryan. Yes, okay. Okay. There we go. Excellent. So you guys can see it? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, so um, this is Family Search, and I just wanted to show um, uh, uh, something cool that uh, my family left for me because uh, the gospel principle is uh, how uh, our family will leave stuff for us for us to um, use and be able to grow with. So um, this is something that I find really cool, and uh, it's uh, something that uh, one of my I believe it's my great 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 grandparents left me. Mm -hmm. so, um, and oh wow. Um, okay, so, uh, right here. Okay, so, it, okay. So, um, there we go, uh-huh. So, right here is John Taylor, and he, uh, walked uh, to Utah to, and became one of the prophets of the church. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. because of him, he um, uh, helped my family find the church, which was really, really helpful. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it's really cool to see this because... And there's a couple of stories on here. I'm not gonna get into them because I haven't read completely through them. So, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I didn't know this until about um, about a month ago. So it's it, this is pretty new to me. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. So what do you know? <laughs> uh, this is for, for Ryan or anyone else also. What do you know about John Taylor? 
I thought he was one of the prophets of the church. Well, uh, well, one thing is he was one of the first members of the church. Mm -hmm. Not not the first, but he was close to one of the members. So. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So um, also, uh, let's see. Let me make sure just to 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 make sure I'm I'm searching something because I I want to. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Yeah, so uh, wasn't John Taylor? Yes, okay, there we go. I had a kind of a brain cramp. Uh, John Taylor was also in Cartridge Jail when the mm -hmm. prophet Joseph Smith was assassinated, okay, with Hiram Smith, mm -hmm. okay. And he wrote Section 135 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Did you know that? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I do. So, okay. So very, very interesting, really. And and he was wounded during that attack on the prophet, and he had a bullet that he was he had to keep. They couldn't take it out, and so he he remained with that bullet uh, the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I, I I I heard about that, but I didn't remember who it was. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. So, so. Um, Ryan, in the in the um, in the lesson here is talking about the the family tree. You know, why why do you think that we we make here the connection between the deciduous trees that we have been studying and uh, your family tree. What would be the connection? Um, that they both uh, leave different uh, markings, I guess, uh, showing uh, how old they are. Um, like uh, two lessons ago, we uh, learned about like fossils and stuff. Not, not a whole mm -hmm. lot, but we talked about it. Um, and how they have left uh, clues uh, showing that uh, they have been around and when they were around and stuff like that. So. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. So Sydney here says it. That's cool. Joseph Smith is my fourth grade uncle. Mm hmm. So. Um. And he says also, we are always joined together and sealed for eternity. Okay. So how does it make you feel, Ryan, to know that, you know, one of your ancestors in a direct line, really, okay, is a, um, you know, that he was a, a witness of the prophet Joseph Smith. He was one of the first converts to the church in the Restoration. How does that, you know, change your viewpoint of things? Or well, affect your viewpoint? Me, mm -hmm. oh, well, it makes me really happy because um, these men were in really hard times and were uh, really uh, pushed and had lots of trials and knowing that they did this for um, us, that uh, makes me really happy because uh, they cared for us enough to die for us. So. Yes, uh -huh, absolutely. Uh -huh. Sydney, you know, says that uh, she's related to Joseph Smith. Emma says Joseph Smith is one of my removed cousins. Okay, so they are. So here we have Emma and Sydney. They probably didn't know each other, but they are related. Okay, 
you know, through the prophet Joseph Smith. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that is, that is very, very interesting. You know, it also makes me think that when, when you study the lives of your ancestors, okay, of who you are related to, um, it could make you, uh, I guess, if you wish, a little bit more valiant or courageous. In, in in thinking, hey, if if they if they did those things like you were saying, if they were able to sacrifice so much for us, I can do my part. Okay, I can stand for for the values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's also cool because um, it tells us more who we are and what our some what uh, of what our goals are in, in life to be more like Christ. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that is that is a very, very important thing to to remember. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in the in this lesson you can do two assignments. One one would be related here to your family tree where you look at uh, your family tree and study and share some story from your family tree and the other one is okay uh, the, the assignment on, on a progress report on the project okay all right Justin says that he has a comment let me uh, unmute Justin go ahead Justin uh -huh. uh, can you hear me yes mm -hmm. okay well, just thinking about um, like your, like the ancestors and all that stuff. Um, uh -huh. There's this, there's this, like I'm not gonna go into the details or anything, but um, one of my great great grandmas, like I think six times up, I'm not sure, maybe a little down, um, had Joseph Smith Barrett's testimony to her of the gospel, and so she wrote down to her um, descendants later, which um, is me and my siblings and so on. Um, her testimony of the gospel and what she, and what and that she knows it's true and stuff. So I find it cool and spiritual. Very, very important. Excellent. Okay. You know, how about let me see. You you inspire me, Justin, to to do something. What do you think if if we were to put as a as an assignment also an assignment opportunity, if you wish, for this lesson? For you to write in Family Search, okay, you could go into Family Search into your own tree and either write a story about one of your ancestors, okay, like this is a story that you know, you can find your ancestor in, in the tree and write that story if it's not already there. Or you can even go into your own um, part in family tree and write the story of how you uh, obtain your testimony okay you could do that you know for even for your own all right you know because uh, time time will pass all right and if you don't write the the, the experiences that you have now they, they may you know fade away in the memory okay so what do you think about that? Would that be a good good alternative assignment, guys? Okay, Anna says that would be cool. Okay. Sounds good to me. Yeah, all right. Well we'll we'll make it. We'll make it so here click on click on John Taylor, Ryan, since you have him there. All right. And let's open the the so see here it says uh, memories. Okay, so click on memories and the tab there. Okay, so there we go. So this is the a life sketch of John Taylor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um. So here's like his birth dates and stuff. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, that if you scroll to the top. Um, okay, you see. can click on uh, yeah memories. Oh, uh huh. 
All right, and here we have the photos and so, documents. Mm -hmm. So do you guys want to see the documents? Yeah, keep scrolling down. What else is, is there? Is there something else at the bottom? Okay, and then the, um, here there are some stories. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So, I've looked through this one, I believe. So, uh -huh. um, it's just kind of uh, what he did in his life. So. Mm -hmm. so, if you guys want to read that or... I'm not sure. That's right, yeah. Okay. So Emmy, Emma says here in, in the, the question board, he says, one of my great grandfathers found the gospel 10 months after his mother's death. He passed on a love of music that still continues to this generation. We have a book that shares a little bit about his life and it says that he had a pretty sweet voice, not to brag or anything. <laughs> that is awesome. Okay. So that would be also important to make sure that, uh, Emma, to make sure that that story, you know, what you just wrote, that is here in the profile of your, of, of this person in Family Search. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Sydney says that she can't hear anything. Okay. Anybody else having problems or? I can okay. hear you. Okay. All right. Anna says, my 12th great grandpa was one of the pilgrims who came over on the Mayflower ship in 1620. And it is really cool to learn about the pilgrims in history and to learn about the sacrifices they made because I am learning more about my own family history. Okay. So, um, let me respond. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm answering to Sydney. Okay. Okay. All right. So that is a very, very cool thing. So see here, we have learned a lot of things about our own different family trees and the different stories. And uh, so I'm going to add an assignment here for the lesson to, to write one of these stories down and upload that into family search. Okay. It could be someone else, or it could be a story that you want to share about yourself, uh, right? It could be your, your testimony, how you, you obtain your testimony, or some story that, that, that you would like to share, okay? So we'll add that as an option. Okay, anyone else wants to, to add anything else, Ryan? Uh, think I'm good so okay excellent all right so now let's ask Olson to say the closing prayer okay let me unmute Olson okay all right can you hear me yes uh-huh all right Dear Father, I thank you for this wonderful day. I thank you for being able to learn in science and thank you for the gospel eyes. Please bless that I'll be able to have a good rest of our Wednesday and please bless that I'll be able to be safe and we ask these things in my son Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you.